The human being can be a beautiful thing. At our heights we are fit, athletic, educated, wise, intelligent and use these gifts to lift up our brethren and our kind. We create art of these ideals so that we can gaze upon them and be inspired to find the inner strength to become better versions of ourselves in some way or another. But we can also be flawed in interesting ways, brooding, passionate, chaotic. We have achieved great heights of technology, discovery and growth as a species. All in all, despite the day-to-day -day revulsion towards humanity that any sensitive soul must feel in this day and age, let us not forget what humans can be. It is this type of human which can be seen in certain pulp tales. Robert E. Howard typically had strong characters, strong in strength and will. Steve Costigan, Conan the Barbarian, Bran McMahon. Lovecraft saw toughness in intelligence and academia and sensitivity to the world around him, thus casting his tales with students, academics, professors, teachers, antiquarians and so on. To see such fine specimens of humanity, either physically or mentally degraded to the point of being unrecognizable, is existentially horrific and a key element in Lovecraftian horror. As such, in this video series we will be looking at another aspect of Lovecraftian horror, the degradation of the human being. The degradation I speak of in Lovecraftian horror comes in the form of physical degradation, but as the physical is tied with the mental, I'd simply suggest you ponder on the psychological state of the characters in the examples I'm about to give. I wonder too if you'd agree with the typically held belief that Lovecraftian horror is more an existentialist psychological horror than physical. The fact is that Lovecraftian horror is a lot gorier than what face value shows, enough to make Saw look like a joke in comparison. Let us see some examples and then get into the relevance of such content in Lovecraftian horror. Lovecraft depicts the degradation of humans often enough in his tales, sometimes resulting in death and sometimes not, though one might find that a mercy killing is in order. The best example to highlight the fall of a great human into an utter revolting horror is seen in The Thing on the Doorstep. In this tale we saw the character of Edward Pickman Derby turned into, well, The Thing on the Doorstep. Something so degraded, pitiful and foul beyond what our senses could tell. What was it? Essentially, well in the story it was the rotting, putrefied corpse of Asenath Waite, one of the other characters in the story, into which a wizard had cast his soul. Imagine being in such a situation, your soul cast into the rotting, foul corpse of another being, and then being animated just enough to pass on your message. Lovecraft describes the encounter of the protagonist with this Edward entity so. When I opened the door into the elm-arched blackness, a gust of insufferably fetid wind almost flung me prostate. I choked in nausea and for a second scarcely saw the dwarfed, humped figure on the steps. The summons had been Edward's, but who was this foul, stunted parody? The caller had on one of Edward's overcoats, bottom almost touching the ground and its sleeves rolled back yet still covering the hands. On the head was a slouch hat pulled low while a black silk muffler concealed the face. As I stepped unsteadily forward, the figure made a semi-liquid sound like that I had heard over the telephone, glub glub, and thrust at me a large, closely written paper impaled on the end of a long pencil, still reeling from the morbid and unaccountable fetter. I seized this paper and tried to read it in the light from the doorway. In the end, all that is left of this Edward figure is, quote, mostly liquescent horror. Contrast this with how Edward is initially described in the story. I have known Edward Pickman Derby all his life. Eight years my junior, he was so precocious that we had much in common from the time he was eight and I sixteen. He was the most phenomenal child scholar I had ever known and at seven was writing verse of a somber, fantastic, almost morbid cast which astonished the tutors surrounding him. This perfectly highlights my theory as to Lovecraft using remarkable people as the poor souls who face the forces of the mythos. The logic is of course the same as we see in a film like Predator. If we had any regular human face off against the alien hunter, it would not have made the Predator look so impressive. Instead he faces off against Arnold Schwarzenegger, who at that point was already established as a sort of cultural demigod in his films and winning many bodybuilding contests. Because I'm a stud, I'm ballsy, I don't take no shit from anyone. Arnold initially gets utterly beaten down and only by dumb luck does he survive that encounter. So seeing someone as fine a person as Edward Pickman Derby become a putrid twisted mess is more so horrific. A further example would be at the Mountains of Madness where we see the researchers of Lake's team dissected, torn apart, shredded into human gore by the elder things upon waking from their eons long slumber. 
The implication is that the elder things somehow were resurrected when humans dug them out of the mountains and weren't in the best of moods about it. Although one might think, well, the elder things were just pissed off and that it was self-defense. I'd argue that was not their main reason for doing what they did. Later in the story, we see Danforth and Dyer, the two main surviving protagonists, see various everyday objects like cans of food torn apart, and it's concluded that the elder things, confronted with bizarre objects, normal to us of course, simply wanted to study these things. In short, we humans were given the same level of respect and acknowledgement as a can of peaches essentially. It wasn't even that these elder things were malevolent, it's simply that we were nothing to them. In the horror in the museum, we see the abominable Ran Tegoth, which requires nourishment to live, as all things do. Instead of simply eating meat, it crushes and sucks its victims dry. We see this first with a dog, and then the crazed owner of the museum, George Rogers. This passage describes Rang Tegoth and what remains of George Rogers. Fully ten feet high, despite a shambling, crouching attitude expressive of infinite cosmic malignancy, a monstrosity of unbelievable horror was shown starting forward from a cyclopean ivory throne covered with grotesque carvings. In the center pair of its six legs it bore a crushed, flattened, distorted, bloodless thing, riddled with a million punctures, and in places seared as with some pungent acid. Only the mangled head of the victim, lolling upside down at one side, revealed that it represented something once human. Rogers is not just killed but left an unrecognizable husk. It's no death fitting anything but insects and spiders who do that sort of thing to each other all the time anyway. The voodoo orgies seen in the Call of Cthulhu saw people who saw their end at the hands of the degenerate swamp cultists in ways which caused some of the police of the search party for said people to be sick and faint. Although, as human as any of us, these cultists we can argue were inspired and influenced by great Cthulhu to reach this level of gore so bad that it sickened and terrified people beyond regular murders. Degradation can also come in forms which the person does not die. Many tales, as we saw in the last video of this series, see humans altered in some way or another to the point that they choose to rather die than remain in that state, degraded forever. A quick summary would be Arthur Germain, who, upon learning the genetic makeup of his bloodline, immolates himself. Then there's the Shadow of Innsmouth, which features a character, the uncle of the protagonist, who shoots himself upon learning he will become a deep one if he does not. Of course, the protagonist chooses to accept his fate. It becomes a matter of being able to either deal with the new state of being or not. While on the subject of the Shadow of Innsmouth, I might also mention the degradation of Innsmouth as a whole. It once was a fine, prosperous, clean, safe and upstanding fishing and sailing village. A credit to its people and the American civilization, but then the shadow fell and it rotted and the stink of fish overtook it and it lost its former glory. I need not mention here any particular cities in our world today because I'm sure you can think of a few who went the way of Innsmouth. The outsider sees the protagonist finally realize he is this ghoul-like entity. The degradation there is more of a mental case, as up to that point he saw himself as simply being just another human, although, as far as the story goes, he never was. Or, if he was once human, he became very much degraded for his long time spent alone in that castle. As mentioned in the previous video of this series, we see degradation into madness with the rats in the walls. The ending leaves the protagonist insane and a murderous cannibal, as were his ancestors, not to mention the things that were feasted upon. Those too were grotesque and twisted. The lurking fear sees a similar situation of, of a family being degraded over time. Both involved old families who had fallen, a common theme for Lovecraft. A very visceral example of degradation can also be seen in the masterpiece of cinema, The Thing. The whole premise of the film is that of an alien cellular life form taking over other living things and imitating them all the while having its own agenda to spread itself like a virus. There is one scene in particular that stands out to me. We see one character, Bennings, become infected by the thing and begin to change. Caught before it could fully form into him or to reform him, it tries to escape only to be stopped in its vulnerable state by the rest of the team and this inhuman sound comes from it. It isn't Bennett!
There is something truly astounding in the scene which affects me, and I dare speak for other Lovecraftians when I presume you'll agree it feels different than most other horror scenes which come to mind. I have watched a lot of horror films, read a lot of non-Lovecraftian horror too, which features some kind of entity which must be overcome. Dracula, Godzilla, giant killer animals, werewolves, demons, aliens of various sorts, clowns. <laughs> However, this scene, imagining that I was one of the witnesses to it, to see Benning scream like that invokes a guttural, primitive, panicked urge which overtakes all others in me that whatever this thing is, it must be annihilated at any cost. No other scene, barring that of Lovecraft's own writings, have instilled that kind of feeling in me, and that is amazing. The ironic thing here is that at this time, there is actually no immediate threat. The Bennings thing is in a weakened, defeated state, vastly outnumbered and unarmed, showing no signs of aggression or intent to fight back, and the team, not yet knowing of the real harm the thing entities can do to them, are not especially concerned for their immediate safety. Yet at that time, it feels like it is the greatest threat to human life and sanity. Amazing writing and truly a brilliant example to the immense potency of Lovecraftian horror. There was another type of degradation present in Lovecraft's tales, racial or ethnic degradation. A few tales of Lovecraft's feature this element, which shows society featuring fully human people, but described as degraded in nature. Some examples would be in The Call of Cthulhu. Firstly, the swamp cult consisted of people of a Louisiana swamp who other people of the same region shunned. Secondly, there is mention of a group of Eskimos who shun a degraded tribe of fellow Eskimos who they consider evil. In both cases, the worship of the Great Old Ones and Cthulhu led to this fall from grace, and along with a spiritual decline, at least to me, it seems to be there is also a mental and perhaps even a physical decline, perhaps a change in physiognomy. In the shadow of Innsmouth, we see too that there was a group of island-dwelling Kanakis, I believe is the term Lovecraft used, shun a tribe of another island for the same reasons mentioned above. The Dunwich Horror makes clear that there is a line between the large Watley clan and that there are those who are degraded and those who are not. If in these examples both groups, the degraded and the preserved, are both equally human, what was Lovecraft getting at? I know the leftist agenda pushing so-called journalists faggot ass cornhole and cocksuckers who slander Lovecraft at every turn will use this aspect to prove how problematic he is because he describes certain factions in some stories badly, but will ignore the inconvenient fact that in each case we see one people divided, with one faction being disgusted by another faction of their own race. The reasoning for this comes from Lovecraft's upbringing. Although lacking the expected wealth of such a figure, he was very well brought up and was basically upper class. He had class, came from a good family, and could trace it all the way back to England. Class in the socio-political sense is linked to wealth, typically, generational wealth, but I think we can all agree class is a matter of conduct and sensibilities, and good breeding implies that these values are passed on generationally. So in other words, you learn them from your mother and your father and so on and so forth. There are many rich people who are trash, after all. We all know these types. To tarnish this good breeding and gentlemanly class was horrific to Lovecraft, and as such, I believe he manifested this personal horror of his into some of his characters. Hence, some humans becoming fallen from civilization, even if that be in the context of an Eskimo tribe, Louisiana swamp folk, or the Watleys. I guess a blunt, very blunt, yet useful comparison in more contemporary ways would be something like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, program I loved watching when I was younger. You have the main character coming from West Philadelphia, born and raised, a sort of inner city urbanite, someone ghetto in other words, and he moves to Bel Air with his extended family who are decidedly higher up in class and behavior. I think we can see this type of behavior in real life to be sure, so I don't think Lovecraft has been too arrogant. I recall being in various cities in my global travels and seeing utterly classless behavior. 
I was in Itaewon in South Korea and saw a bunch of loud, drunk yobs from England completely flouting the norms of the country in broad daylight, loud yelling and unable to hold their drink. In the Canary Islands, where I go quite often, there are no shortage of similar types from England and other European areas who came to these fine islands and behaved similarly. I am half English in blood and mostly so in upbringing and the way that these people behaved revolted me and I felt no kinship to them despite sharing blood. I mean, I love nothing more than enjoying some drinks on my travels around the world but that behavior is not becoming of someone of class. I think that is what inspired Lovecraft to create a degenerative element in some of these peoples despite them sharing the same race. So what's the degradation of the human being all about? What's the point in the mythos tales? The human being in these cosmic horror tales are not simply killed or twisted. In fact, being killed is pretty mundane. It happens, well, as the term mundane implies, it's a, a daily occurrence. Well, it only happens once to you, but it happens all around the world. There are many things you can be killed by, and it's just part of life. No, in these stories, they are killed with such inhuman gore that it revolts us exceedingly. There is no dignity in these mythos deaths, no acknowledgement of the human as being anything of value. It serves to highlight how little regard we are given by the universe. We like to think that we are special and that even in our demise there should be some sort of respect given to us. If we are killed by an adversary, well then, fair play, you got me, that's my innings up. Take for example Predator again. In this film we see the alien being hunting members of an elite military team. Many die in gruesome ways, that's true. However, there is always that ever-present acknowledgement of each side, kind of relationship there. Why though? Why should we accept that as how we should go out in this life, that we are entitled to this sort of acknowledgement and respect? If we squash a bug by accident and all that remains on the floor uh, a bunch of guts and juices. Does it really matter to us? Would we even notice? And our civilizations, as beautiful as they can be, are not entitled to simply thrive, as is in the case with Innsmouth. There are threats to it, shadows which can overcome our civilizations, or over us, the individuals who make up a civilization in the forms of madness, degeneracy, and a loss of direction as a society. This is why I believe Lovecraft so often used the theme of degradation in his weird tales. So with that said, this is my video essay done. It took a while and involved a lot of rewrites, but I never like to release something of this importance without being sure of every word. Sadly, this video will surely be demonetized to some degree due to the usage of words I've used here like kill, death, murder, etc. Faggot ass, cornhole and cocksuckers. I don't know about you, but I don't like the idea of altering how I naturally speak to suit the sensitivities of some advertiser or censor on YouTube. You won't cry now. I don't care about the ad revenue money being lost, but demonetization also means that YouTube hinders the chances of one's video being found in search results. So I'd appreciate merely a like and a comment if you have the time and only if you feel my efforts here are deserving. And this does help boost its visibility on this platform. Until the next one, see you in the comment section down below. Cheers.